Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord Jesus. Maka suleba nu bradosh ne eketezi. We give you praise, we give you praise. Thank you, Jesus. Mando pradeka suleba tosa panka lune moza diska paruzaya. Thank you, Father. We give you thanks, we give you praise, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. We give you thanks and we worship your name. You are exalted, O oh God. 
We bless you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is with us. What a glorious time we have before us as we go into the presence of God to share the word of God. I want to welcome you to day five of our Bible study where we are talking about understanding God. And today we're going to be starting part five of, um, of this series. Part five has been four amazing episodes. And this is the fifth episode that we're going to be talking about understanding God. And we've talked about quite a lot of things. And um, one of the things we're going to do today, we're going to discuss some of the attributes of God, uh, parts of God's nature. We're also going to talk about how we can apply some of the things that we have learned. How, how does what we've learned so far, how does it apply in our Christian walk with God, in our understanding of God, and how we carry out our, 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 our devotions to God, our prayers, our fellowship. What does it mean, um, you know, when we talk about all the things we've talked about, God being loved, God is just, God is, you know, merciful, you know, and all the stuff we've talked about so far. How do we apply it in our spiritual life? And today we're going to be, you know, spending some time to talk about just that. Praise God. So I want to do a quick recap. Um, some of the things we've talked about already. Um, I don't know if there's... The same network seems to be back. Uh, so if you can see me, if you're watching this and you can see me, please just uh, leave a, a, a message in the comment section so that I can know. Praise God. All right. So we've talked about the attributes of God. And we said that the attributes of God are those parts of his nature that um, that would would be there that we would be able to see in God if there were no creation and uh, the characteristics of God are those things that are those attributes part of those attributes of God's nature that we see in relation to his creation hallelujah so the attributes of God there are two types the metaphysical and the moral and the metaphysical attributes of God are those attributes that if there was no creation whatsoever, they would be true of God. And then the moral attributes of God are the attributes that we see God express in relation to his creatures and to his creation. So, for example, when we talk about the metaphysical, we're looking at things like God is omniscient, for example. You know, those are metaphysical attributes. And then you have, you know, God is self-sufficient. God is, there's, God is a necessity. There's a doctrine called the necessity of God. So we have the immutability of God. These doctrines are true whether or not there is any creation. If God didn't create angels, if God didn't create humans or animals or trees or mountains, none of those things, God, these things would still be true of God. And then the moral attributes are the attributes that we see expressed in relation to God's creation. Hallelujah. So, for example, God is love. Now, God is love even if there was no creation at all. But the expression of that attribute is seen in relation to God's creation. Hallelujah. And we say God is just. Yes, God is just with or without human beings or any kind of creation at all. But we see the justness of God expressed in relation to his creation. So the attributes of God that we, we get to understand from the perspective of his creation. And you see many times the Bible will give us examples or, or, or symbols you know, from creation to explain God. Um, you will see things like the way a father 
loves and corrects his son is the same way uh, God corrects those who loves him, uh, who love him. You, you see things like uh, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a king who, you know, and, and so you find that a lot of, of, of um, attributes of God are seen in relation to his creation. And this is quite important because when we then talk about the characteristics of God, God's characteristics, they are those things that we see, the, the things that we see as a response as, or as a, as, a, in, as a product of God's nature. All right? So these moral attributes and these uh, uh, metaphysical attributes, they produce some characteristics that we can identify. Praise God. And, and so, for example, because God is holy and because God is just, we have his righteousness and his wrath, right? So because God is holy and because God is just, then we see him as righteous in relative to, in, in relative to humans and we see his wrath being revealed against unrighteousness. Praise God. So, so these are some of the characteristics of God. When we talk about we talk about God's sovereignty, for example. God is sovereign over all of his creation. All right? He's sovereign over all of his creation. And what does that mean? That means um, he, he's able to, he has total control over all of his creation. And the way, the, the, the part of his nature that makes that possible is his omniscience, his omnisapience, his omnipresence, and his omnipotence. Hallelujah. We're going to talk about some of these others as we move on. We talked about how it's important for us to be able to see God's justice and God's justness. Hallelujah. In relation to the gospel. You know, so we must understand why sin will be punished. Right? We must understand why God frowns at iniquity because he is holy, right? And, and he's just. So he, he, he says every disobedience must be punished. And so even when Jesus bore the sins of the world, God had to execute the same punishment. And Jesus cried on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because God is just. He's not going to break his promise. The Bible says he will not alter the thing that is gone out of his lips. Another thing we've talked about in relation to God's attributes is that God's attributes are not, do not it does not mean that God is comprised of all these attributes. Alright? It does not mean that God is there's a, a pie chart of God's characters. And, you know, he's 10% holy and 15% loving and 5% just and 4% wrath. You know, no, no, that's not what it means. So it, it, it doesn't mean that God, God is more loving than he is angry. It doesn't mean that God is holy, but he is also, you know, long-suffering. It doesn't mean that. It means that every one of God's attributes are absolutes. God is absolutely just, completely just. God is completely holy. God completely hates sin. God completely loves. God com is completely wise. So these attributes, God is, is, it's not that they make up God. God is each one of these things in their entirety. Praise God. So when the world you know, there's this argument the world makes about a, a, a loving God wouldn't send people to hellfire. But they don't understand that it is because of God's love that the world is able to continue till now. Because, because of God's love, he sends his son to die, to bring in grace. And what grace does is that grace withholds his wrath. Grace keeps his wrath. As we're going to see today, God is immutable. He doesn't change. And so, everything God has always hated, 
he will always continue to hate. Everything God has always loved, he's always going to love. And so, God is not suddenly okay with sin, and that is why he no longer um, gets, you know, executes judgment against sin. No, that's not the way to understand God's change, the, the, the way to understand God's uh, uh, um, attributes. Praise God. So the way to understand God's attributes is God is holy. Every part of God is holy. Every part of God. And, and when we start to talk about the Godhead, um, maybe uh, this in the next class or in two classes to come, when we start to talk about the Godhead, we will understand that God is an entity that cannot be quantified in human measures by anything that we know we cannot put god in a scale and say this is how you know hundred percent of god right because percentages exist in 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 our human in our human measurement scales praise god and so um, what that means is whatever god is the one that fills all in all whatever he is whatever his, his size whatever his 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 breadth his depth his height his width whatever he is he's all holy he's all loving every part of him hates sin every part of him you know is 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 is, 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 is merciful every part of him but the thing that would make him you know, respond in a particular way is dependent on what we're going to talk about today regarding dispensations. So we're going to talk about that in a bit today. Let me see if there's any other thing we can cover. All right, we talked about God's justness and we talked about the things that we can use to see God's justness. All right, and we said God is just in that he shows no partiality. All right, so he has no favorites. He has no, um, no one that is closer to him, you know, by, by that he proof. No, he, he doesn't have that. God has no, the Bible says there's no respect of persons with him. He says anyone who approaches him with a humble and a contrite heart, all right, so it's not, you don't have to be tall, you don't have to be fair, you don't have to be wealthy, you don't have to be educated, anyone, anyone. So God has no preference. He doesn't give any preferential treatment to anyone. That's one way we see God as just. Then God is against the mistreatment of others. We saw that in Zechariah 7 verse 10. Then we talked about in giving out rewards, God is also just. The Bible says he is not unrighteous to forget you and my labor of love. And so, this is God's justness. Um, the, 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 the way we understand God's just, justness is that God sets a rule and brings up a penalty for breaking that rule. So, for example, God says anything I say to do and you don't do, anything I say don't do and you do, that is a sin. The punishment for sin is death. Alright? Now, God's justness is such that he will himself bind himself to the rules that he set. Alright? That's, that's the degree to which God is just. And I'm sure this is not something that is very easy for human beings to do. Um, in fact, you'll find out that many humans will bend the rule just if it's going to affect them. All right, so let's see if we can move on today. We want to talk about some of God's metaphysical attributes. The first one we're going to talk about is the aseity of God. The aseity, A-S-E-I-T-Y. The aseity of God. I don't know if you've ever heard this term before but what it means is god is self sufficient god is self sufficient so what what this means in essence it, it describes 
God's ability to self-exist and to self-provide so such that God doesn't need anything and God doesn't lack anything. Praise God. This is the self-sufficiency character or attribute of God. He is the uncreated creator who in himself, God has everything that he ever needs. He is not lacking. So you cannot take away from him because he's excess and you cannot add to him to make him more complete. God is God is that um, being who is um, is, is he, 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 he's Whatever he is, how do they say? Whatever he is, is off or by himself. That's, how, that's what the theologians say. God, the the, the aseity of God means that whatever God is, he is the cause of it. Hallelujah. So he, he, he brought it about. He made it possible. He brought it, you know, to being. Praise God. And so I remember when I was very small, maybe about six or seven, and I was, you know, my, my mom was doing the dishes in the kitchen. And, you know, I just used to ask a lot of questions at the time. And I remember asking my mom, um, where did God come from? And I think it started from where did we come from? And then, you know, she started to explain about creation. She said, who created us? And she said, God. So who created God? And she's like, well, God just exists. You know, God just, God just exists. And, and for my young mind, and for many people in, in our logical minds, it's difficult to, um, a, to understand a being whose existence has no cause, right? And, 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 and so, um, God is, is that being who, and, and you know, science comes up with all sorts of few uh, years ago, they come up with the God particle, which they call the Higgs boson particle, and they say that this particle is responsible for um, all of life as we know it. And then another person comes up and says, "No, it's a force." And and so there's all sorts of theories. And some people say there's um, alien life somewhere that started all of what we know, and there are billions and billions and billions of light years away from us. And whatever they may say, you know, all of those things are suppositions. But if we were to give them, you know, the benefit of doubt and say, okay, let's say there's an ET, um, an extraterrestrial being who, uh, who's responsible for all the universe that we see, um, all the stars and the planets, and, and they created all of this, and they exist outside of the realms of time, then that would be God. You know, whatever, whatever, whatever is responsible for, for this, you know, whatever we call life today, that being is God, right? Because that being exists outside of time, space, and matter. So where did God come from? There is a law in, in when, we, when we discuss uh, uh, apologetics, you know, regarding the, the, the origin of God and the origin of life, called the law of cause and effect and that law says that the chain of cause and effects go back until what we call the first cause now the first cause has no cause the first cause is what we call god that's that's who we call god he's the uncaused cause praise god god is the is the being who has always continued to be in, 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 in the book of Exodus, you know, when God called Moses, and, God, and Moses begins to, God begins to tell Moses what he's supposed to do, and go to Pharaoh and say this, and, and go and tell the children of Israel, get ready. And, and Moses asks a question, who will I say sent me? And then God gives him a very interesting answer. I am that I am. Now the word I am, if you're going to do a little bit of English, I am is an act is, is a passive word of the is a passive form of the verb be. Be is the active word, alright? But then I am 
is is a present continuous state uh, um, version. So it means I am. It, it is saying that I exist. I continue to exist. I am a being that is in existence. It doesn't talk about when this this organism began to exist. It doesn't talk about when this organism. Um, is going to stop existing it's just I am in the past God is I am in the present God is I am and in the future God is I am so God's existence is not is not limited to time and this is what we call God's aseity over time it is that God is not bound by time but he's also not limited by time. He's not restricted from entering into time and doing things in time. This is the quality of God's aseity. He's, he created time and he's able to go into time and to do things, right, in, the, in, 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 in time for the period of time that time exists. Hallelujah. This is God. When we talk about God's aseity, you can be sure that this God that we serve, who says, I am that I am, He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's I am yesterday, He's I am today, and He's I am forever. Past, present, and future, God's existence remains constant. Praise the Lord. That is the aseity of, of God's aseity over time. What about the aseity over humanity? God is free to enter and exit humanity at will. He can, he can enter into relationships with man and break relationships with man. He is free to take on the form of man and, and not take on the form of man. He's free to use animals to pass on a message. He's, used to, um, he's, he's free to, to use rocks. Jesus says, you know, God is able to make these rocks cry out. So God, is, God, God has this self, self-existing autonomy. Because he's, he has this authority over all of creation... He has total autonomy from creation. So God cannot be influenced by his creation. Now this is, this is something that we are going to learn as we go on. We talk about God's sovereignty. right? So when we say God cannot be influenced, we are going to look at that when we come to God's plan and purpose in the ages. Everything that creation wants is subject to God's plan and his purpose in the age, in the ages, as, as, as man's history has passed. It is God's purpose and counsel that prevails. Everything that God has designed to happen, that is what happens. It is not, it is not a case of, I want a car. And I'm praying to God for a car. But God doesn't want to give me a car. God wants to give me a motorbike instead. It is a motorbike that I will get. Praise God. This is, the, 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 this is what God's autonomy, not being influenceable, that's what it means. You cannot make God do something that he did not intend to do in the first place. God doesn't change his mind. He has total autonomy over all of his creation so he's completely independent he's not dependent on us for anything god didn't create man because he was bored or he was lonely or he he needed comp- no, no 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 he didn't need companionship god is the self-existing god he's the one who comes about by himself hallelujah god almighty the God that we serve, the very same one. And so when we approach him, we approach him in time, but 
He is not in time. He is in eternity. And that's his power over time. That everything in time is sealed from eternity. Hallelujah. Let us look at a few scriptures just to understand a little bit more. Let us look in um, in the book of Genesis chapter 14. We want to see God's autonomy over mankind, over his creation. Genesis chapter 14. Verse 19. This is the story of Abraham and Melchizedek. And Melchizedek had come to meet him. And the Bible says in verse 19, he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. So God is the possessor of heaven and earth. That means he's outside of heaven and earth. Isn't it? Genesis 1 1 says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And so, he is the owner. He exists outside of it. So, there's nothing in it that he depends on. I don't know if, that, if you understood that point. Very important point. Let's, let's, the whole of Psalm 50, the whole of Psalm 50 just talks about why God should be praised. Not because, why we worship God is not because we worship, we, 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 he, like by worshiping God, He's, uh, he's entitled to we're entitled to get things back from him by worshiping God we, we get blessed we, he owes us a blessing no 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 we talked about it earlier we said when we talked about God being jealous right Psalm 29 2 give unto the Lord the glory that is due to his name so God deserves all the glory that is due unto his name if it is due to him then it should be given to him. And so Psalm 50 just talks a lot about the reasons why God's glory is due unto him. Psalm 24 says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. I want to read one last place in Job. In the book of Job chapter 41. Real quick, real quick. Verse 41, verse 11. He says, Who hath prevented me that I should repay him? Whatsoever is under the whole heaven is mine. So nobody is, God doesn't owe anybody anything. Somebody says, Oh, I gave my tithe. So God is committed to. No, the Bible says, No, that's not true. God owes you nothing. In fact, everything that you are. You are bought with a price. And if you understand the, the slavery rules in the Bible, the, the slave was the owner, was owned rather by the slave owner. And everything that the slave needed for welfare was provided by, by the slave owner. So God is completely independent in his self-existence. God is not... Some, some people will say, God, if you are God do this and if you don't do this i'm done with you news flash god doesn't need anyone god doesn't need anything there's nothing we have there's nothing we have that god that god needs let me read it finally in the book of acts chapter 17 Verse 24 says, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needeth anything. So, we may worship God as if he needs our praise, but no. You may think, oh, God needs my money. No. When you give money to God, God is not obligated to do anything. We are giving God whatever you give him out of the bounty that he has blessed you with. I'm doing this work that I'm doing for, the body, for, for, for God, not because I expect a blessing. That's not the purpose for, for, that should not be the purpose for anybody doing ministry. It's not because I need a blessing. No, I'm doing this because 
God owns me. And if he wants me to do this, this is what I will do. Praise God. And so should every one of us. Let's move to another because we have quite a bit to cover today. We might go slightly beyond one hour. Let's talk about the necessity of God. The necessity of God. In the popular scripture in Genesis chapter 1, I already quoted it today. The Bible says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. All of life, all of life as we know it, exists within heaven and earth. All of man's existence, the, the far, farthest planets, the, the, I mean, billions and billions of light years away. I was reading recently an article that uses infrared. Um, they, they have, they have a, one of the biggest telescopes in the world that's going to take pictures, you know, using infrared uh, technology to take pictures of planets that are billions of years away. All of those things fall under the heaven and the earth. And then the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And I said earlier, God, the, the Bible doesn't start out trying to explain God's existence or his eternality. Right? We're going to see that. We will may get that today. I'm not sure. The Bible doesn't, doesn't come out to explain God's existence. But what it does tell us is that before there was any heaven or any earth, there was a God. And so, something was existing right before time. There was something in existence. And as I said earlier, the word I am is a present continuous tense. It's a state of existence that doesn't have a beginning and an end. It's just, it, 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 I am is different from I started to be. I am is God saying, I am eternal. Is God saying, there was no beginning and there was no end. Everlasting, eternal God. And so, this, the doctrine of the necessity of God says that something existed before time. And that something was, was huge, was massive, was powerful was super intelligent was for it to have created the kind of order that we see in the universe that something must have been you know beyond human human comprehension and that something is god hallelujah that something is one it is infinite it is eternal it's it's not it's not something that is that is describable by any parameters that we have in heaven or in earth. And by heaven, I mean the first heaven. All right? The, 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 the first heaven where you have the, um, the, the stars, the planets, you know, the cosmic system, the galaxies. Hallelujah. So that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's another aspect of God's existence. He, if, if, if heaven and earth are wiped away, there will always be something that must exist. And that something is God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Madoka, Payaba, Shila, Kosia. Let's go to the book of Hebrews chapter 11. It's a popular scripture. And it says, chapter 11. Verse 6, it says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. So, this word is another, it's another form of the word am. Alright? He is. He is. That's third person. Third person singular. He is. He is. God is. So, whoever comes to him must understand and believe 
that God is eternally existent, eternally self-existent. He did not come to be, he has always been. He has been God from before time began. We must, we must receive with faith the, the understanding of God's eternal existence. Praise God. We must receive with faith the reality and the doctrine and the truth that God's existence is infinitely unity and eternal. So these three things it is God is one, He is infinite, and He's eternal. These are what we understand about God's existence. Let's talk about the immutability of God. Immutable. Immutable is a word that means unchangeable. A position that cannot change or doesn't change. Praise God. In the book of Malachi, chapter 3, the first part of verse 6. Let's quickly jump there. God says, For I am the Lord. I change not. This is an assertion that is made by God himself. God himself makes this claim. I am the Lord. I change not. He doesn't change. The book of James 1. James 1 verse 17. It says every good gift comes. Every good gift comes. He says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. So this is God. There is no variableness. It doesn't, it does, it's not one thing today, another thing tomorrow. No, no, no. He is constantly God, constantly unchanging, constantly the same, always the same. In fact, the writer of Hebrews puts it this way in Hebrews 13 verse 8. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Isn't that amazing that Jesus Christ, who is God, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do you remember in the book of John chapter 8, when, you know, Jesus was talking about Abraham, and they were, you know, trying to accuse him. And Jesus says, before Abraham was, verse 58, before Abraham was, I am. That's a very weird statement to make. But Jesus is pointing to the eternal existence of himself as God in the flesh. The eternal existence of the word made flesh. We'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about the Godhead. So Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Bible says, God himself says, I am the Lord, I change not. God doesn't change. There are three reasons why we know God, God cannot change. There are three logical reasons. So... It is enough for me to, to agree that God doesn't change because we just read it in the Bible that the God doesn't change. He himself has said that he is the Lord, he doesn't change. So it will be enough for me to take this at face value and have faith in that statement. But if we wanted to provide a logical reason why God cannot change, there are three of them. The first one is that change in any situation involves time. So you can only measure change over time. You can only say this is how this situation or this person or this thing is versus this is how it was. Right? And how it was is in the past. And, 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 and you can say this is how it is now. This is how we expect it to be in the future. And you will ask any economist or anyone who does, you know, analysis, you know, year-on-year -year analysis 
you know, company growth, national growth, any kind of growth, you will find that it is measured over time. When you, what we call a recession, a depression, you know, a boom, with all of these things are changes that are recorded over time. Now, because God does not exist in time, then he cannot change. It is only things that are bound by time that can change. This is one reason, right? God isn't bound by time. He lives and exists outside of time. Praise God. Another reason why God cannot change is, is this. Change is either for the better or for the worse. So, so a change is, is, a, is an improvement or a reduction, right? For lack of a better word. So, if, if something improves, then it has changed. If something gets worse, it has changed. But Jesus says, be ye therefore perfect, as your Father in heaven is perfect. So, God is perfect. He has no, no possible way to improve on what he is. If there is anything that we could if God could lose any trait, if God could lose any part of his nature, then he would cease to be God. So God is, is perfect in himself. In every aspect of his being, he is perfect. And that's why we talked about his attributes and we said God is the fullness of that attribute. Praise the Lord. So God cannot change because he cannot be improved on or he cannot become a worse version of himself this is god and then the third version is um, when change involves receiving new information for example um let's say i used to think that my neighbor is a thief and so i used to be very um, distant and cold with that person and then i received new information that oh no this person isn't a thief this person has been robbed and so is just very um, cautious and, and, and or maybe this person's father is very wealthy and that's how he make, he's gotten so much money. He didn't actually steal, he inherited a lot of money. Now as soon as I get that information that oh what I thought about this person was incorrect, then my behavior will change. Now that behavior, that change in behavior, that change in state, that change in will is, is coming as a result of new information. Praise the Lord. When a baby is born, the baby is fed with food, and then after a while, some more food is given. New, maybe new quantities of food, new types of food, and when the body receives that information, then it begins to change. So change can come about as a result of new information. But we know that God is omniscient that is he knows all things god knows everything if there's he cannot learn god god cannot learn anything right god cannot cannot be taught anything and so if there's no new information and when we come to the subject of god's omniscience we're going to talk about five things that god knows the five categories of things that god knows very interesting and i'm sure it will bless you and 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 so when we talk about change why god cannot change because he cannot receive new information there's nothing new so human beings can discover new things human beings can happen upon new uh, new elements and and new ways of doing things and new technologies but with god he has every knowledge every knowledge praise god so god therefore cannot change But there's a way that, you know, has been argued that God has changed. And when we look in the, and in this place, we're going to really take a bit of a look at dispensations. Because one will argue that the God we see in the Old Testament is very different from the God that we see in the New Testament. The God you know, many people say the God of the Old Testament is a God of wrath, and the God of the New Testament is a God of love. 
But I, I showed us earlier in this in this series how in the Old Testament, in the book of Isaiah chapter 6, God shows Isaiah a vision about heaven. And, and he sees in his vision, he sees living creatures before the throne and they are singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. And then, thousands of years later, God shows another man called John, John the Beloved, a vision of heaven in Revelation chapter 4. And this, in this vision also, he sees um, living creatures before the throne and they are singing the same thing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. And I talked about the, con- the consistency of the heavenly vision. And I told us that we should be careful about how people suggest that they have seen visions of heaven and very rarely do we find that these visions um, match each other. Usually they are usually different in content, you know, location, or you know, different things. And, and so it's always very careful for us to, it's important for us to be very careful. All right. And so in the Old Testament, God is holy. In the New Testament, God is holy. So what does this mean? Because when we talk about God in the, in the Old Testament being a God of wrath and, and God in the New Testament being a God of love, the only reason why we call it love is because God doesn't strike people down. You know, this, the, the sanctions against iniquity and sin are not summarily executed as it was in the Old Testament. And, and so, to understand why there's this difference in relationship with man from, this, from God's perspective, it needs us to understand that there are, there's something God instituted in his relationship with man called dispensations. Dispensations. Dispensations are, um, another word you could use for dispensations like a government, like an administration, a system of operation, you could call it um, a, a regime, right? You could call it um, a, a, a leadership, right? A method of operation. You could, it's, 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 you could call it a rulership, call it so many things, right? A dispensation, according to biblical theology, is the way God has operated and related with men in different ways throughout the history of man. I'll say that again. Dispensations, really, in, in biblical theology, refers to how the different ways that God has related with man, the man, the creation, um, over the course of man's history. Praise God. This is what we call dispensations. Praise God. I'm just about halfway through my notes, but we're going to wrap up anytime soon. Praise God. Dispensationalism is the theology, the doctrine that teaches that God relates to people according to the dispensation that they belong to. Alright, so God, God hasn't always related with man the same way across, across all dispensations. And we recognize seven dispensations in the Bible. So we, we, the, the, the entire Bible is kind of divided into time segments or dispensations. Praise God. This is not a full-scale teaching on dispensations. I, we just want to explain that how, how God hasn't really changed. All right? Between the Old Testament and the New Testament, while we are seeing different systems of operations between man and God. Praise the Lord. So there are seven dispensations in the Bible. From Genesis 1-1 to Genesis 3-7, we have the dispensation of innocence. And this is when man did not know good or evil. Man did not know what was, you know, man just lived, right? Lived according to how he related with God. God didn't have um, any, there there was no, no sense of sin. There was no sense of right or wrong. There was no sense of law, you know, in man at the time. God God just related with man at that time. But you remember in Genesis 3, 6, right, the Bible says that Eve saw the fruit 
and she ate it she and her husband and you know there's different discussions about whether or not some people say Adam was not with her but then you know Genesis 3 6 says Adam was with her so there's um, uh, th there's that debate that goes on but that was the end of the first dispensation and the second dispensation was when man began to be governed by his conscience all right and so man began to have to know right and wrong and that means there was a morality that was developed and morality was the thing that God used to relate with man and in that time the Bible says the children of men did wickedly they did bad things they did evil things they chose the evil all right so much so that God said it repented him that he had made man and he wants to destroy all of mankind this was the age of the dispensation of human conscience and then the third con the third dispensation was the dispensation of human government and people began to gather themselves into clusters and into tribes and nations and began to rule themselves and in um, at this point you know people were in in their tribes in their tongues and in there and let's let's look at for example in the book of genesis chapter 10 you will already find that nations were already in existence and so let's look at genesis 10 5 this is by these were the isles of the gentiles divided in their lands everyone after his tongue after their families in their nations so this was the period where humans were governing themselves god allowed humans to govern themselves all right and then the fourth dispensation is the dispensation of promise and remember in genesis 12 when god appeared unto a man called abram right and god said get out of your father's house your kindred and all of this and go to a place that i will tell thee of all right and 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 god made a promise to him and god made this promise to him and that promise became the precursor to what we call christianity today the bible says abraham believed god and it was counted to him for righteousness all right so at this point god god chose abraham god called abraham and made this promise to him and all their life was lived by this promise in this period you know the the tribe the nation of israel was formed and they had gone into captivity in in the land of egypt god had sent moses you know and, and aaron his brother and they um they went to rescue them from captivity and they were leading them into uh, from egypt to the promised land and by this time in Exodus 19, uh, we had had the Red Sea, we had had all sorts of miracles, all right? And if you read, you know, the early parts of the book of, of Exodus, we begin to see how the children of Israel began to murmur and to grumble against Moses and against God. And God was, you know, getting really angry with them. And God was getting wor worried and, and, and really, you know, vexed. And then this led to the introduction of what we call the law. Now, the law is, that's the fifth dispensation. The next one is this, the dispensation of grace. And the last one is the dispensation of the millennial kingdom. These last three are the ones that really af affect us or relate to us in this current dispensation. The one that just passed, which is the dispensation of the law, the one we're in, which is the dispensation of grace, and the millennial kingdom. Let's read in Romans chapter 6, real quick, verse 14. So the dispensation of the law gave way to a new dispensation. In the dispensation of the law, God gave the children of Israel the laws by which they would um they would relate with him the laws were of three different types they had the moral laws 
the judicial laws and the ceremonial laws. The moral laws were based on God's character. All right. So we were talking in this series about God's character. And so you'll find that the moral laws that God gave the children of Israel, which are based on his character, will also appear in the New Testament because God's character doesn't change. Praise God. Let me say that one more time. You will find that the moral laws that God gave the children of Israel, for example, the Ten Commandments are a part of God's moral law to the children of Israel. Now, the moral laws were based on God's character. Now, because God's character doesn't change, you will find that the moral laws are repeated in the New Testament. That's the only aspect of the law that shows up in the New Testament. Why? Because God's character never changes. God is as angry with sin as he was in the Old Testament as he is now in the New Testament. Praise God. So, that's the first part of it. The second part of the law was the ceremonial laws, which were meant for the children, the nation of Israel. It was like their constitution. How do you resolve disputes? How do you get married? How do you all sorts of things? How do you take care of the temple? How do you take care of widows? How do you take care of I mean the poor among you, the slaves? God gave them rules, all right? And then the third um category of the, of the law that God gave the children of Israel was the judicial law. And this really was, um, dealt with you know, the, the, the resolution of disputes, how the judges were supposed to rule, how the, 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 the kings were supposed to rule, and things like that. And so, these are the three aspects of the law. Now, we know that there are about, in total, about 613 laws, thereabouts. Um, I know it's over 600, maybe thereabouts. And, and, and they were expected to keep everyone. Okay? But in the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, the Bible says something very remarkable. It says, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, that is, the law was a shadow of good things to come. It wasn't the good thing itself, but it was a shadow of good things to come. So when God gave the children of Israel the law, he was giving them something that was hinting of something better that was to come in the future. Praise God. So the law, the dispensation of the law that God gave the children of Israel was something that was meant for a time, for a season. It wasn't the real thing. It wasn't, this wasn't the end goal of God's relationship with man. So in this dispensation, this is how God ordained to relate with man. Hallelujah. She says, for the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year, continually make the comers thereunto to Perfect. Verse 4 says, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. So, God instituted the law to the children of Israel only and any foreigners who would decide to, um, to join them by immigration, you know, by nat- naturalization, by marriage, whatever, by what, whatever legal means, um, anyone who became an Israelite was bound by the Jewish law. All right. Now, this Jewish law is—it it wasn't the perfect law, but it was a an, a hint, a, a precursor, something that you know would testify of something better to come. And so, God, for a while, allowed the blood of bulls. And of goats to suffice for the treatment of sin. But in reality, in reality, the blood of bulls could not take away sin. And I want to quickly explain something about that. There's some people who have gotten into some kind of covenants, you know, blood covenants specifically. You've been involved with one or two um, groups, 
individuals maybe and you've got into some kind of covenant and and you're afraid you know you don't know how to get out of it there are different kinds of oaths and covenants all right there's something called a gentleman's agreement for example that is settled with a handshake and in the times when honor was at a premium uh, when, when people had integrity one could have a gentleman's agreement on something that was really important and it would count right and then you have that handshake and that's a kind of an agreement between two parties and then you had other kinds you had um, contracts that were drawn up by the law courts and those agreements are also binding um, but are breakable then you have um, other kinds of agreements now that begin to enter into a more supernatural or sinister uh, mode of, of operations and so you have you had people who would slaughter um, animals to make a, a covenant with another party or on behalf of another party and much of Africa is you know our history is very uh, uh, fetish and and filled with things like voodoo and black magic and you know people call they say these are religions right but these things these these methods of operations of, of religious practices were really trying to bring people into some kind of spiritual bondage because the bible says the life of flesh is in the blood god doesn't play with that in fact he commanded the children of israel never to eat anything that um, had blood in it all right and so you make this into a covenant with, 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 that was made with blood. But it's, you know, and, and then now when you come to the category of blood covenant, which is the highest form of covenant, there are categories even within this blood covenant. You have the blood of animals, you have the blood of beasts, but then you also have the blood of humans. And some people use human blood to make their own oaths and covenants. If you have ever joined a confraternity in Nigeria, you've been made to enter a blood covenant. And, and you know, you, if you've done maybe some kind of uh, uh, secret societies, they also have some funny, uh, uh, evil blood covenants. But there is a particular blood that is the highest kind of blood. It is, the, it is the most potent, it is the most powerful kind of blood that when that blood is applied, every other covenant can be broken. You know when you have a master key that can open every lock in the, in the house, the one who holds the master key can never be afraid of a locked door because he has the master key. The blood of Jesus the blood of Jesus is, is the blood, is the highest, purest, most powerful kind of blood. There's a song that says, There is power, power, wonder, working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, Wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. So the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus is the most potent blood ever, ever in existence, ever. It will break, it will break the covenants that have existed years before you were born. It will break the covenant that have existed years after you were born it will break the covenant that existed that you were not even aware of it will break every kind of covenant spiritually speaking the blood of jesus the blood of jesus how does it do that the blood of jesus washes us it washes us it purges us and cleanses us and removes everything that could have caused us to be stained and when we are when we have received robes of righteousness, when we are now white as snow, as the Father sees us through the, through the righteousness of Christ, when the blood has made us white, 
it washes away all those covenants. And that is why as a believer, you can stand in the place of prayer because you understand the power in the blood of Jesus. You can stand in the place of prayer and bring every covenant that you've entered into, knowingly or unknowingly. Some people's parents have placed them under covenant. Some people's in-laws, some people's neighbors, some people's landlords have placed them under You can stand in the place of authority as a believer and tell the devil, I am washed with the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is the greatest and most powerful covenant that you could ever engage in. And so the blood of bulls, God recognizes that it couldn't have washed away sins. But God permitted it to be so for that dispensation. And when God introduced the new dispensation, by what? By the slaying of his son, Jesus Christ, who died for our sins. His blood now becomes the perfect antidote to sin. And when that sin is wiped away, we come under this new dispensation of grace. What is the dispensation of grace? The Bible says the grace that brings salvation has appeared unto all men. All, all men, all humans, everyone. The grace that brings salvation. And that's the dispensation of grace. It is because of God's grace that we have access to his mercy. It is God's grace that brings his love to us because of God's grace. God's grace is God's love expressed to man. That's the dispensation of grace. And because we are in that dispensation of grace, because Christ has already been nailed on our behalf, on your behalf and my behalf, and on the behalf of everyone in the world. Because of that, we are beneficiaries of God's grace. And we stand in that dispensation now. So it is not that God has changed. It is that the dispensation has changed. And because God is just, he will not break his covenant that he, no, he alter the things that have gone out of his mouth, he's going to stand by his word. And he's going to say that all the sins that a person can commit in this dispensation can be cleansed by the blood of Jesus. And so, if you haven't been saved, if you've not been saved, this is a very good time for you to appreciate what Christ has done. Because if this were in the Old Testament, my dear friend, you may not be so comfortable God would have required you to pay the price for your sins but thank God we are in the dispensation of grace where it is not that God condones sin it is not that God is not upset with sin it is that his mercy and his grace withhold his wrath but there is coming a time in the next dispensation where the wrath of God is going to be poured out. And when that wrath is poured out, people will wonder, Oh, why? Why is God doing this now? Why, why, why is God so angry? But we will, at that point, it will become clear that the cup of sin is filled to overflowing. And so... The dispensations recognize a pattern with which God deals with men in each dispensation. God will give you a responsibility to do something. For Adam, it was tend the garden. Don't eat out of this. You know, God will give you a responsibility. There might be a failure in that responsibility. And God will pass judgment because he is just. But because he is also merciful, he will provide grace to move on. And when it costs came for what he did he put a mark on him so that nobody would kill him that was judgment and grace praise the lord the doctrine of dispensationalism it emphasizes three things the 
Bible is to be interpreted literally where it is literal. In another series, we're going to talk about the Bible, but not in this one. We're going to talk, you know, extensively about the Bible. Dispensationalism recognizes a distinction between the the nation or the people of Israel and the spiritual church of Christ. And it divides the Bible into different dispensations. The immutability of God means that everything that God has said, he will do. You can check all the prophecies in the Bible. You can check all the, all the prophecies that God has made um, from, from the Old Testament and see how many of them have been fulfilled. God's word doesn't fail. He doesn't say anything that was supposed to happen that doesn't ever happen. That's God. He doesn't change. And that means you can bank on him. You can trust him. You can believe him. You can go to bed knowing that God's word cannot be broken over your life. What has God promised you? What has God said to you? What has God told you? What instructions has he given you? What assurances has God told you about your future? About your purpose? About the processes you're going through? About the tribulations of your life? About your purpose? Your life's assignment? What has God told you? you can rest assured that the same God who hovers over his word to bring it to pass will bring it to your, to pass in your life in Jesus' name. Amen. And so we're going to stop here for today. We've extended by about 16 minutes, but we're going to stop here and we're going to continue again on Wednesday. So join me on Wednesday again at 9 p.m. Um, West African time for part 6. As we get to round up very soon. It's been an interesting series so far, and I believe that those who are listening have been blessed. I thank God, thank you for joining me, and I thank God for giving me the utterance. I pray that these words will be meaningful to us in our spiritual journey with God. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a good evening, and God bless you.